Church. Hey, good morning, church. <laughs> <laughs> So the already late flight of 8.30, yeah, it's 11.20 and it keeps getting later and later and later. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, good morning, church. Guess what? We are still in the airport. Well, we're not still in the airport by the time you see this. Hopefully. Hopefully. But it's been kind of a long day. <laughs> We've had a lot of delays, and uh, I'm gonna say that we packed so much into four days, and now here we are sitting for hour after hour after hour. It's almost midnight, and uh, poor Joe has to pick us up from the airport in Hartford. So it's like we had 48 hours to be in, and um, probably 12 of them have been getting ready for this moment. <laughs> So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> so hopefully your day is much more exciting than ours because this is not very exciting. We were we were thinking this would be so exciting that you know what you need to watch is us on the moving walkway. <laughs> the moving walkway is ending. <laughs> very, very soon. <laughs> we're getting kind of squirrely. Hope you're having a great Sunday morning. Hey, I hope you are having a great <laughs> Sunday morning. You can see I've got my little vacation beard going. That'll be gone tomorrow if we ever get home. But uh, in the midst of that, uh, yeah, here we are. All right, I say we pray in a little bit because uh, the moving walkway is empty. It is. <laughs> Looks like that flight's about to take off. Nope, not us, not our flight. Still waiting. Is that our plane? Still not our plane. Nope, not our plane. Uh, hey Jeff, what you doing? Waiting. Still waiting. Still waiting. A closer walk with me Grant to Jesus that's my plea Daily walking close to Thee Let it
just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, that's my plea. This world of toils and snares. Well, if I falter, Lord, who can? Who with me my burden shares? None but. Just the closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, that's my plea. You know that daily walking close to thee. Let it be. When my feeble life is old, time for me will be no more. Oh, guide me gently. Just a closer walk with thee. Well, grant it, Jesus, that's my plea. You know, daily walking close to thee. Well, let it be. So the one good thing about a nice long night like this is you never know who you're going to meet. We kind of befriended this family who was heading to Tampa Bay and uh, she was flying by herself. She had been at this airport for nine hours with her two children. Ages six and three. <laughs> Having a great time. So we played with them for a while for her. And watched some of the planes take off. And there then, actually are planes taking off, so that's a good sign. Not theirs, not ours. Nope. But it's good. People are good anywhere you go. Very true. So wherever you are, here we are. It's, uh, is it Sunday already? I guess so. Feels like it. <laughs> Why don't we uh, start our time together with a word of prayer? Uh, gracious God, you meet us wherever we are, wherever we're going, and wherever we're coming from. And you put people uh, in the midst of those travels and on our journeys. And uh, we thank you for that. And uh, we hope and pray that uh, you continue to guide us wherever it is we're going next. So be with us wherever we go and be with us along the way. Amen. Amen. Let's keep this day rolling. Oh, let's do it. I can't wait to see what happens next. It's going to be awesome.
Years ago, we were flying out of the Minneapolis airport and we were standing in line at the security gate and uh, the kids were small, I mean, really little. Uh, probably about the same age as this family that we ran into tonight. And uh, while we were in the security line, Joe, who was, again, a little guy at the time, started playing with the couple who was standing behind us in line, this, this kind of like retirement age couple. And they were playing and having a good time, just as you would have with kind of a, a grandfatherly type and a grandson type. Just interacting as human beings, having a good time, waiting our time in the line. And uh, right when it was about our turn to put all our stuff on the conveyor belt to send it through, I turned to Joe and I said, well, okay, tell Mr. Koppel goodbye. And he said goodbye, and Ted Koppel turned and smiled to us, and we parted ways in that little moment of just uh, sharing that time together. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he came, when Herod, but an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask for me whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, we'll be with you again. I'll be with you until August 1st. So, a couple more Sundays. So, I'm glad this came up this morning. Psalm 85. What are the Psalms? They're songs, right? They were, they're meant to be sung. They were never written so that they could be spoken. They were written thousands and thousands of years ago, way before Jesus came around. And they were meant to be sung in community. So Psalm number one, this is a very Lutheran thing. <laughs> Psalm number one in the book, is hymn number one. How many, how many psalms are there? Anyone know? 150. So, after Psalm 150, what do we have? Hymn 151. And then it goes all the way up until the very end, which is It's very high number in the 800s. Anyway, can't find it. 
just so you know. So next time we need to use the book and look up Psalm 97 or Psalm 22 or 23, just remember this is a song book and Psalm number one is hymn number one. Kind of fun to know, right? So for this morning, I'm going to start with a question and end with a question. And so my question for you as we begin is, for all of us, how are we pointing to Jesus Christ? How is our life pointing to Jesus Christ? And there's a very famous piece of artwork that Pastor Jeff happened to have in his office. Now I'm going to walk around so you can all see it. You'll, you'll, it'll make sense when you see it up close. Do you see Martin Luther, Jesus on the cross in the middle, and who do you think are on the left there? It's you. It's the congregation. So you see Martin Luther pointing to the cross. The reason I'm showing you this is because when you all are back to heading to the city, to the museums, there's another famous painting of John the Baptist doing the same thing that Martin Luther showed. But they're out in the desert instead of in the church. So this is supposed to be a congregation. And Martin Luther's preaching And the whole point of the piece of art is to teach a theological lesson. Everything that comes from the pulpit should be pointing to Jesus. That's what the Gospels are all about. And so that is what we are called to do. So that we, in our daily lives, become just like Martin Luther from the pulpit. Sorry, I'll stand in the middle. I move around a lot. I know it's annoying for you camera people. So we are called to do just what Martin Luther's doing from the pulpit, but with our own lives. So the question we start with is how are we doing this, but in our lives? Of course, there's the other side to that. How are we not doing it? Right? But for right now, just think, how are we doing it? How is my life, how is your life pointing to Jesus Christ? So a couple weeks ago when I was here, we were talking about different ways of reading scripture. And we used the word hermeneutic, which is just the academic way of thinking about different ways of interpreting scripture. Because as I'm sure you're well aware, the one thing that separates Christians from each other, parentheses, how many denominations of Christianity do you think there are in the world? Anyone have a guess? 50 plus. 50 plus, okay. 1,000. Do I hear 2,000? <laughs> How about 10,000? Yeah. Real. How about 30,000? <laughs> there are over 30,000 denominations of Christianity around the globe. Blows your mind, doesn't it? Yeah. And what is the one thing that creates the differences among all these denominations. How we read the Bible. We all believe in Jesus. We all believe in baptism. We all believe in the same core things. But the way people decide to interpret the Bible is what has over time created in excess of 30,000 different denominations. 
So, clearly there are a lot of ways to read scripture, right? <laughs> we are all very familiar with the literal way of reading it. But, during the period of enlightenment, we took it one step further and started to think of different ways that we could actually read the Bible. And one of the ways that I find particularly helpful is reading it through the lens, so we put on a different pair of glasses every time, and it's the lens of power. How is power being used in these stories? So think about it for a moment here. We have King Herod. He's got a lot of power, right? But not complete power, because he's just a minion of the emperor in Rome. So he is a king for a very small kingdom in a very small part of the Roman Empire. So sure, he's king in his little pond, but he's also in an ocean, and there's an emperor who's in charge of the ocean. But for the purposes of this story, King Herod has a lot of power. What about Herodias? It gets a little confusing because Herodias the mother and Herodias the daughter are not really distinguished very clearly in the story. They have the same name. They both have a lot of power, don't they? The king gave them power. And they had a choice. First of all, the king had a choice as to how to use his power. And then, the mother and the daughter, they both had a choice as to how to use the power that they were given. And then, of course, John the Baptist, before he was killed, he had power too. And he had a choice as to how to use his power. And if you read this story through the lens of power, you can see that Herod was a little drunk with power. Do you think a king would really want to give someone else half of the kingdom? I wouldn't. If I were king, I would want to be king of the whole kingdom. I wouldn't want to have to share my power with anyone. So he's being arrogant here. He's showing off. He probably hopes and thinks that Herodias won't ask for half of his kingdom, but yet he offers it because he's drunk with his own power. He's abusing it. He's throwing it around, flaunting it, telling everyone, look how much power I have. And then King Herod asks Herodias, who pleased him and his guests, you can have anything you want. He then empowered her, just like we would be in front of a genie, right? The power to ask for whatever we want. Here is Herodias, able to ask for whatever she wants. And then Herodias empowers her mother, shares her power with mom. What should we do, mom? What should we do with all this power? And what happened? You see what happens here? See how power is being misused here? And what did it end up doing? It ended up taking John the Baptizer's life. And what was John the Baptist doing? Remember the picture I just showed you all? What was he up to? He was busy pointing to Jesus. He was busy out on the highways, out on the roads, out in the desert, proclaiming to people, prepare your hearts. Someone greater than me is on the way. He was a threat to those in power. He was a threat because people listened to him. And King Herod was worried that people would listen to John the Baptizer over him and that he could create a riot. He could end up stealing that power from Herod by influencing the people, showing them what was just and right and peaceful, totally contrary to what Herod was up to, because Herod was a vicious king, 
assassinating and crucifying people all the time. And here, John the Baptizer was exposing this abuse of power. And here we have John the Baptizer beheaded and on a platter. No more. His voice ended. And therefore the threat to King Herod and his power also over. So you can see here how fluid power can be, right? John the Baptizer, he was just this crazy man wearing camel skin and shouting from the rooftops. But he was powerful enough that a king felt threatened by him. And then look how powerful Herod was. And look how powerful Herodias became. The point, my sisters and brothers, is that we are just as powerful. We may not see that in this story. We may just think this is one of the gross, annoying stories in the Gospels that we like to pass over. But we have just as much power as John the Baptist does. We have just as much power as King Herod does. We have power beyond what we could possibly imagine. We just don't believe it. Because we don't know what to do with it. What would we do with our power? Do we trust ourselves with that kind of power? I'm not sure I would trust myself. We're all humans. We make mistakes. We have good days. We have bad days. But we have power beyond measure. And that is more frightening than thinking that you have no power. And we are left with a choice. What will you do with the power that you have? What will you do with it? You have the power over your own life. You have the power to influence a lot of other people's lives. You have the power to do good, and you have the power to do evil. We all do. That's why we avoid evil as much as possible, is because it's awfully close to home, isn't it? It's one decision away. So I say all of this to inspire hope within you. When you look around this crazy world, don't see yourself as a powerless victim, but see yourself as a powerful influencer who can do a lot of good. You can do a lot of good in your own life. You can do a lot of good in other people's lives. And you can do enough good that it spreads around the world. Do you think that the saints of old just woke up one day and decided, I'm going to be martyred today? Or I'm going to change the world today? No, they were just like you and I. And they made a decision to use the power they have to spread love and peace, and justice, and goodness. And often it meant their lives ended sooner than they wanted. Jesus' life ended sooner. John the Baptist's life ended sooner. Think of all the saints. Saint Stephen, and Joan of Arc, and Maximilian Kolbe, and during the Second World War, and we could go on and on and on. Martin Luther King, I mean, think of all the people who were just one person, just like you and I, and decided to use their power for good. Yes, the ending might be scary, but the whole point of believing in Jesus Christ is believing that we do not have to fear anything at all, not even death. That is what we believe. We believe in a God who conquered fear, conquered sin, and conquered death, and then said, you go and do the same. 
and it's going to be okay. I promise. That's what Jesus is telling us today. Don't be afraid to use your power for good because even if the world kills you, even if you suffer for it, even if you lose everything for it, you're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Don't be afraid. So, now I end with the question that we all need to think about. How are we pointing to Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen.
David, Al, Paul, Elizabeth, Regina, Shirley, Luke, Diane, and Joyce, as well as for our brothers and sisters being loud or silently in our hearts. if you can send our plane.